Amen. All right, there in Hebrews chapter 6, look at verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we do if God permit. Now what I want to talk about tonight here, look, he's talking about the principles of the doctrines. He's talking about the foundations. He goes into the doctrines of baptisms and he mentions the doctrine of the laying on of hands. That's what we're going to preach about tonight is the doctrine of laying on of hands. Now this phrase is used a few different ways in the Bible. And I want to show you, we're going to show you all of it, but really we're going to focus in, narrow in just on the one aspect, the primary aspect what it's talking about in this passage, laying on of hands. There's sort of an honorable mention, if you will, or dishonorable mention, I guess, depending on how you see it, that sometimes when it says laying on of hands, it means like you're grabbing somebody, like you're going to fight with them or lock them up or something like that. In Nehemiah, when they were restoring things, there were men that were working on the Sabbath day and then they were coming in and selling and there were people from outside of Jerusalem coming in just to make merchants, he calls them. It reminds me of what Jesus did in the temple. But Nehemiah told him, he said, Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lied ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you from that time forth. They came no more on the Sabbath. So he's like, You come back in here, buddy. I'm going to put my hands on you, right? So Nehemiah is like threatening them, like, I'm going to do violence to you if you come back. So that is one aspect that it's used in the Bible. That is not the doctrine that, that uh, Hebrews 6 is talking about. And again, it reminds me of when Jesus whipped him out of the temple, right? He did it twice. You know, the same way. You know, he went into the temple because they were making merchandise. In Esther, it's talked about where Haman, it says he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai. You know, he wanted to grab him, get rid of him. In Matthew 21, it says, but when they sought to lay hands on him, talking about Jesus, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So the Pharisees wanted to lay hands on Jesus. So that it says that a few different times. Jesus warns us that in the end times, he says, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and shall persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So laying on of hands is a bad thing, typically, right? In the end times, because we're Christians, because we're Bible believing, born again. Baptists, when preaching the gospel, they may lay hands on you. Jesus is warning us about that. But again, that's not the doctrine that's being taught in Hebrews 6. There are a few other mentions in the Old Testament that uses the phrase laying on of hands, where it's talking about laying their hands on a lamb or on the scapegoat, on the sacrifice where the priest had to do that. That's also not what is being taught here. There are many mentions about Jesus and the apostles praying and laying hands to heal somebody. And again, that also is not what's being taught here. What we're talking about here in Hebrews 6, when it says the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, it's talking about ordaining or appointing and anointing and charging, giving somebody a charge. And this is something that's used throughout the Bible for kings and priests and prophets and rulers and pastors and deacons and evangelists. This is something that the Bible teaches. There's a purpose that God has for laying on of hands. And we have a pattern from the beginning of the Bible all the way through the end that we see. So where you're at there, in, uh, let's see, you're still in Hebrews chapter 6. Turn to Acts chapter 19, if you will. Now in Matthew chapter 10, it says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now there are a lot of people that misuse this phrase of the laying on of hands where they, the Pentecostals in particular, and I feel that it's necessary to debunk what the Pentecostals do. When they want to lay hands on you and you roll around, and, okay, that's not of God, all right? That is not of God's Holy Spirit. This is not something that the Bible teaches in the way that they do it. And there's a few places they'll use. That's why we're going to Acts 19. In Acts 8, they'll reference that sometimes where you see Philip the Evangelist. He gets Simon the Sorcerer saved. And he sees them laying out of hands and men receive the Holy Ghost. Now, because the people that are 
using these scriptures to their own advantage, the Pentecostals, because they're unsaved, and they don't have God in their heart, they don't have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as they ought to, they, it's easy for them to be deceived. Not seeing that Simon the sorcerer repented. Not seeing the fullness of the story there about salvation. And really, they make a mockery of God and the things of God. They do it for money. Right. And you know, most of these Pentecostals, frankly, they are possessed by devils. Yeah. If you've ever seen what happens at these places, and I've seen it firsthand, it is literally, it's full of devils, it's total wickedness, and the Pentecostal laying on of hands is something to beware of. Don't ever let somebody lay hands on you that you don't know. Don't let ever let somebody right. pray over you that you don't know whether they're saved or not. Right. So be cautious with that. Now you're in Acts chapter 19. Look at verse number 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Right, I believe he's saying here, are you saved? He's like, well, your disciples, your followers, but something was wrong. He could tell something was wrong. So he's like, have you received the Holy Ghost? And what he's doing, he's questioning their salvation to find out if they're really saved. And they said unto them, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. I mean, you don't know about the Godhead. Hold on, red flag, right? Something's wrong. Look what he says, verse 3. And he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Right? Well, we came out of the ministry of John. And listen, it could happen. There is the possibility that you might run across somebody one day and they say, well, I got saved. Some guys from Steadfast Baptist came to my church and I believed. And, you know, now I've, all I have to do is put my faith in Jesus and be a good person. And you might say, uh, what have you believed? What are you, what, what's going on? How come what you're saying isn't lining up? And look what he says here. What then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. So he's saying, well then why did you even get baptized if you haven't put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Verse 4, Then, Paul, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on Him which should come after Him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So he's telling that he's defining repentance. He's defining that baptism of repentance. It's that you should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now I want to give you sort of an example of this. Brother Dale, would you help me here for a second? So imagine you knock on somebody's door and you come up. Hey, are you a Christian? Yes. You're a Christian. Okay. Well, do you believe that that putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone is necessary for salvation. No, you have to do the works too. You have to do the works. Now imagine if this happened. You're like, well, where, how did you become a Christian? Well, those guys at Steadfast told me. I, I, I listened to them and I prayed with them and I went and got baptized. This is possible for somebody to go along, to get along, and they're doing it in a crowd and they're not really getting the whole message. They're not really understanding everything. They were, these were disciples he's speaking to here. And imagine if this happened. You say, well, hold on. Hold on a second, buddy. Here, let me show you the Scriptures. Let me prove to you that it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Let me compel you from the Scriptures. Right? This is our job as a soul winner. So we would begin to prove Jesus Christ to all the Scriptures. And then imagine you come to the end. You say, well, now let me ask you this. Do you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ alone? Yes, I do. All right, bow your head and repeat after me. You know, tell Jesus you want to be saved. Now imagine right then, He would receive the Holy Ghost forever. He would be sealed unto the day of redemption. And then once he's saved, the power of the Holy Spirit can fall upon him and he can prophesy mightily. Then he can turn around and say, hey, wait a minute. My wife isn't saved. Hey, hey, come here. You need to hear the Gospel. It's in faith alone. You're not saved. Come here. You've got to hear this. Right? He could turn around and prophesy as well. Thank you, brother. You can sit down. So I want to make this point here that in Acts 19, when they lay hands on them, this isn't, this isn't a magical happening where like the Pentecostals would give you this impression, like you touch them and they start shaking and flopping. and That is not biblical. That is not what's being taught here. Okay, Number one, it's faith alone. It's salvation. And then God's Holy Spirit can fall upon you. Now if you would turn to Acts chapter 6. And again, the Pentecostals are not saved. They don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And they don't believe anything. They're easily deceived because they lack discernment. But more importantly, they lack faith. They lack faith. And that's why they're dissuaded. So we're teaching about the doctrine of laying on of hands, ordaining and anointing and appointing and charging someone to do work. This is a pattern in the Bible. 
And it, like I said, it's for kings and priests and prophets and rulers and pastors and deacons and evangelists. So God uses this throughout the time for a reason. Now you're there in Acts chapter 6. Look at verse number 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. Right? God wanted to say, hey, we got too many people. The church is growing too fast. We need to put some men in leadership. We need to appoint them to a position. Right? They have to be full of the Holy Ghost. They have to already be saved. It has to be evident that they're walking in the right path. And yes, the church is a business. Church is serious business. Amen. Not business for profit. It's not that, hey, let's see, you know, like these Benny Hens and these fake TV preachers. I mean, those people are a bunch of fools. Those people make a mockery of God. They hate the God of the Bible. And they're deceiving the simple-minded into doing foolish things that, that they think they're searching for God. Hey, they have a greater damnation. They really do. They will go to hell. But listen, when, when he says we may appoint over this business, we need to take God's work very seriously, like as if it's our own business. Right? As if you're self-employed. Look what he says in verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased. So what happens? They get these guys. They pick them out. They bring them in front of everybody. They literally put their hands on them. They, at, they give them a charge. They're appointing them to an office in the business. And they're asking God to work through them. They're giving them a charge, instructions on what they ought to do. Verse 7. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now turn to Acts chapter 13. So by using this pattern that God has of setting up people, ordaining them, appointing them to do the business, laying hands on them, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they had great power, and the faith was increased. More people got saved because they used God's method. And listen, I was ordained by Pastor Romero. He gave me a charge that I need to keep. He gave me instructions. He gave me a commandment. And it's my choice to obey that, is it not? And you know, Pastor Romero, he commanded me to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is something I've been commanded to do, but I believe that when he laid hands on, that it's something that God used as His Holy Spirit to give me more gifts, to give me the ability to do the things that otherwise I would say are impossible. Now, he was ordained by Pastor Anderson. There is a lineage here. Now look, we're not talking about endless genealogies, but I want you to understand that things beget like things. Right? Just as much as when somebody gets saved, it's like from faith to faith. Right? And it ought to be the same way that it's from pastor to pastor to pastor down the line. It ought to be from church to church to church. From Christian to Christian to Christian. It's kind of a no-brainer. Human being to human being, right? Dog to dog, animal to animal. You know, we beget the same thing that we are. And one day, Lord willing, I will ordain somebody and they will go and do likewise. We will use the power and the pattern of what God has instructed us and we will lay hands on somebody and they will go start a ministry on their own. And this is the pattern of what God shows us in the Bible. This is His plan and if we obey His methods, He will bless it greatly. Now, if you self-ordained or get ordained by somebody that forsakes God's plan, well, you don't really have to meet the requirements, you know? I mean, really, what, husband of one, what, you can just have as many wives as you want. I mean, come on, do you think God's going to bless that? No, no. If you don't take His plan seriously, if you don't take His requirements seriously, 
God is not going to seriously use you. And you will not have God's blessing. You will not have His power. You will not have His Spirit. Now you're there in Acts chapter 13. Look at verse number 1. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work wherewith I have called them. When you think about it, God had something in mind. They were having a good time. They're working together. They're in the ministry. And God says, no, I know, you, I know you guys are having fun, but I need you to go somewhere else. I need these men to go where they're needed. And in the same way, you know, I didn't really want to leave the friendship that I had with Pastor Romero. I really didn't want to leave the ministry in Fort Worth. But I believe God called me to Jacksonville. Yeah. God said, hey, you need to be in Jacksonville. That was God's plan. And I, okay, God, I'll go. Jacksonville, Florida, what's there? Hey, now I know. I love you guys. I love the new family that he's given us here. And you know, the plan was abide by God's calling, abide by his plan, do what he says, and just watch him bless it. And he has. Now look at verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia. And from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now there's an interesting thing here in this verse. There are scoffers <coughs> that would say they don't believe in the ordination of pastors. And they use this verse, Acts 13, 4. Well, they were being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Can't you see? It's clear. There's no man involved in this picture. <coughs> but what does it say in verse 3? They fasted, they prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. Now turn to Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. So these scoffers that would say, oh, it's just the Holy Ghost, it's not man, there's no pastor to pastor, they kind of cherry pick the verses they want to use. As anybody with a false doctrine, you have to ignore, ignore a lot of clear Scripture to end up where they end up. And so it says that they fasted, they prayed, they laid hands on. And God's plan for spiritual leadership, like I said, is from one to another, from you know, just as much as it's from faith to faith when you go soul winning, God wants to start churches through churches. He wants to send men through other men. And I thank God that He counted me worthy to put me in the ministry. I thank God that He sent me here to Jacksonville. Now you're there in Numbers chapter 27. Look at verse number 15. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before him, which may go in before them, and which may lead them out and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Right? So Moses sees the end and is not. Right? Moses see, sees that his time is up and he's worried about the people. He's concerned. Oh, Lord, we need, we need another leader here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon them. Doesn't this sound like Acts chapter 6 that we just read, right? And he's saying, God says, you know, we need a leader that's a spiritual leader. We need somebody that's full of the Holy Ghost. And he says, take Joshua. He's a spiritual man. Look at verse 19. And set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and give him a charge in their sight. It needs to be a public ordeal. It needs to be in front of the congregation. And this charge needs to be to keep the Word. Now, Actually, let's read verse 20. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, and all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. He's saying the respect and the honor that you have in an office, you're giving that over to this other man. You're saying, now, follow this guy, right? That's what Pastor Anderson did with Pastor Romero. He said, he is now a pastor. The people that follow him need to have the respect that he deserves for following God's plan. Now turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And David said to his son, you know, in the same way, when David was expiring, he said, he said to, so to Solomon the same way. You know, and David had this lineage of both faith and leadership, and he used the same pattern. 
And he, he told him, he said, I go the way of the, all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. He told Solomon, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes and His commandments and His judgments and His testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, whithersoever thou turnest thyself. The reason that God does this is for the next generation. The reason that God wants to, for you to lay hands and send people out is so that we can begin to multiply. We can go and do likewise. And this same pattern, we see it you're in 1 Kings 19. This is where Elijah was given orders by God to set up leaders. Look at verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abimelah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So here he says, there's two kings. As the spiritual leader says, go anoint this king. And go anoint this king. And then find Elisha and anoint him. Lay hands on this guy and get him in the office he needs to be in. Look at verse 17. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees of which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth with hath not kissed him. Now for, turn to 1 Timothy 4. So God is always looking for the next generation of leaders. And I know this is sort of a, a dry topic or not, not a very exciting topic, but there is a biblical pattern here. And we do it God's way because I want God's blessing. Amen. And in the same way, you men that say, hey, you know what? I want to be a spiritual leader. One day I want to grow up and be sent out as God is instructing us here. There's a pattern. You obey His Word. You learn His Word. You be a spiritual man. And then you, their laid hands is on. The blessing is sent. And you go and do likewise. You men in here, take it seriously. You never know when God may use you and even if you say, oh, well, you know, I can't be used. Maybe I've had this in my past or I've done that. You don't know what God will do. Right? Being a pastor is not the only thing there is in service of God. Yeah. There are many other things that God may use you for whether or not you're ever a pastor. And you need to take the attitude, men, very seriously that it's my job to be a spiritual leader. I need to be like that Joshua that has a good attitude and I'm ready to be set. Amen. That ought to be your attitude. You need to be preparing for it. As you turn to 1 Timothy 4, when Jehu was anointed, it says he rose and went in the house and poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee to be king over the, over the people of the Lord and over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab my, thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants the prophets and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. God was using that man in particular. He's like, you know what? Christianity is under attack. Right? The church is under attack. People are under attack. It's God's people. And He says, I'm going to anoint people and appoint people and ordain people to try to defend what's right. What's righteous. And that's why we need leaders. He says, For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. God said, hey, you're going to knock them all out. You're going to go get all of God's enemies. And we may not see that sort of a victory in our day, or maybe we will, but it'll be the day of the Lord, not necessarily our day, right? But either way, we need to prepare now for the future. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Right? So he's saying, hey, be an example. Do and teach. He says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. N neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. 
He's saying, you have special spiritual gifts that were given to you because a man of God laid his hands on you. You were ordained. You were sent out. You have been appointed by God to keep a, an office. And now the Holy Spirit will use you in a special way. And he's, he's telling that these things are to be commanded and taught. He says, command and teach these things. Remind people these things that we need to give attendance to reading. You need to read your Bible. Yeah. Right? You need to learn doctrine. Look, he says in verse 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly, that's completely, to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now turn to 1 Timothy 5. He's saying, take heed to your doctrine. I ask you tonight, how's your doctrine? Right? What do you know about the Bible? What doctrines can you point to and teach others out of the Bible? What don't you know? Right? Figure it out. Take heed to your doctrine. So you know what? I'm not sure on baptisms. I'm not sure how to fight against Calvinism. I'm going to commit myself wholly. I'm going to completely study this out. I'm going to figure it out and let God use me more and more. What do you not know? Figure that out. Now look at 1 Timothy 5 verse 1. We'll look at verse 1 because it's in context here. He says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and to the younger men as brethren. So when he says elder, that's the same thing as a pastor. He's saying, you don't just go up and accuse a pastor. You don't just go up and, you know, there's certain, you should have respect for men of God. This is written again to pastors and deacons and spiritual leaders. Look at verse 19. It says, Against an elder, receive not accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Right, if somebody comes, oh, I heard Pastor Anderson makes all the men in the church shave their heads. You know, say, hey, I don't want to hear this, right? Where's your proof? Get two or three witnesses. Let's make it a public. If it's if what you're saying is real, then let's deal with it. If not, then take your gossip somewhere else. Yes. Right? He's warning that we should we should honor and respect the men that God has chosen to use. And I don't say this to put honor on myself. I say it to point to these men that are under attack. There are pastors across the country right now. There's all sorts of fools on YouTube that are just trying to say, oh, well, this guy, and, and on, on Instagram, and on Facebook, and, and whatever it is, and writing letters and phone calls, and I'm getting them myself from these people that just want to, they want to quickly attack. They want, oh, well, you're doing it different. You're, hey, I've got a Bible verse. I've got a reason. I have a doctrine for the reasons that we do things. And those that do not, they're going against God. They're fighting against God. And some of these men of God, we need to keep them in prayer because that's the face that they see. Right? You think about how Moses was used in God's stead. Moses was used, to, he said, to be a God unto them. In a sense, he's like, you're the mouth. You've got Aaron working for you. But when they look at you, they're going to think of God because you're doing all the miracles. And sometimes men of God that stand up and speak the Word of God and speak the truth, they will suffer attack. And we, as Bible-believing Christians, need to pray for them. We need to uphold them. We need to consider that they have God's Holy Spirit and we need to ask God to give them more of the Holy Spirit. Now look at this. In verse 20, he says, Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Right? There's a purpose for hard preaching. It's to hear and to fear. That's what it taught in the Old Testament. That's what it taught in Acts. To hear and to fear. Why? So you can grow. So you know not to make those same mistakes. Verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Listen to the next verse. Look at this. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. So one pastor to another, he's writing to the pastor, he's saying, lay hands suddenly on no man. Now, I've shown you the context. He's not saying, don't just grab somebody real quick, right? In, in context, he's talking about pastorship, deaconship, the office of ordaining. He's saying, don't ordain somebody quickly. Lay hands on no man suddenly, right? He's saying, if somebody comes by, and, hey, uh, I'm here for the weekend, will you ordain me? Uh, no. <laughs> and it's funny, you may laugh at that, but I, there's this guy on YouTube, uh, Ashfin Yogden. Have you guys seen this guy? He asked, there was this scuffle and this disagreement, and he asked Pastor Romero, well, if I fly down there for the weekend, 
And I've seen the text, well, you ordain me. We'll spend the weekend going soul winning Friday and Saturday. And then on Sunday, you can send me out and no covenant will be a church up in Washington. Pastor, no, I don't know you. Why would I lay my hand suddenly on you, give you my blessing, ask God to bless you when I don't even know for sure that you're saved? Yeah. Lay hands suddenly on no man. We're not supposed to just ordain anybody, any, you know, have like a, a drive through ordination. I've used that term before, you know. I take it seriously. I mean, you need to know who you're dealing with. And, you know, Tyler Baker basically asked Pastor Romero the same thing. Yeah. Well, if I just come on by there, real, you know, for a month or two, will you send me back? And he's, no, why would I do that? Especially with everything that's going on. How, how, why would I do that so quickly? There's scripture that warns us about that. Well, instead, he, was, he settled for going and being ordained from his family, which he calls a bunch of total losers. Yeah. Good job, buddy. Well, it begets the same kind, so what's that make you? <laughs> I ordain you, loser. <laughs> but you think about it, because a lot of these other churches, they are quick to ordain people. And most of these churches are fake churches. So they do fake ordination. You know, oh, come on in. Boy, that is a nice suit. Do you want to be a pastor? Wait, what was your name again? Uh, like, come on. I mean, think about it. I mean, how quickly they want to say, wow, you, you really throw some money in the plate and you drive a nice car and everybody likes how you talk. Why don't you be a leader? We need to be cautious about who we look up to in leadership. We need to wait and test and make sure that God is actually leading them. And, you know, I, I didn't ask to be ordained of a man. I did not go, hey, will you, will you send me out? Will you send me out? Will you? No. I asked God. I said, God, I desire the office. One day, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to have a ministry. And I'm going to get ready now. I'm going to prepare now. I heard this phrase years ago, act as if. Right? You want to be a, a big baseball star? Then act as if now. Act as if you're already that star. Practice every day. Work every day. Work out every day. Well, we're talking about spiritual things. Right? We say, well, you know what? One day I want to be a great spiritual leader for God. Well, then act as if you are right now. Learn your doctrine. Read the Bible. Prepare your heart. Study the things of God. Ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. Act as if God really will fulfill that. If you desire the office of a bishop and you're moving in the right direction, you never know when God might just pick you up and move you somewhere very quickly. You never know. And it's, it's very important. You know, God called me to this ministry and I believe it's not because I was going and asking men. It's because in my heart I sought the Lord. Hey, Lord, hey, I want to be used of you. More and more. And if that means I'm just sweeping the floor and taking out the trash here and, and washing the hands of Pastor Romero day by day, so be it. And you consider this, man. I mean, if you want to grow, act as if you're going that way now. Just plan on it. God's made a promise. He said, if you desire it, so get ready. Look at verse 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll finish with this. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse number 5. <clears throat> when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Being ordained the putting on of hands, I believe gives you spiritual gifts from God that you may not have had before. Right? And I know some of you have said, wow, I mean, I've listened to your preaching back in the day and you're, you're doing a lot better now. You know what I mean? It's a very kind way to say it, right? Listen, I believe that God has given me the ability to preach in ways that I could not before because His Holy Spirit gives me the ability. And listen, I'm, I've not arrived, but I'm just giving this as an example. You may look at yourself and judge yourself unworthy and say, well, I don't have the talents. I don't have the gifts. I don't have the voice. I don't have the knowledge. Trust that the Lord will provide and He will. He wants to see your faith. He talks about, I mean, this guy was not a novice. He says, I saw the faith in your grandmother. I saw the faith in your mother. Now I'm convinced. I'm persuaded it's in you. I've seen it. I know who you are. I'm not laying hands on you suddenly. Now get ready and go. Now you need to stir up that gift you've been given. You need to make sure you're using it. Prepare to go do great things for God. It's our responsibility to use the gifts that God's already given us. It's our responsibility to make sure that we're ready for the new gifts that God will give us. And you know, we need to go preach the Gospel. We need to do the work of an evangelist. And I thank God that this church, we do that. We do that very thing. And I, you know, I just... In Revelation... It says that he says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand on me. Right? He sees Jesus, he sees this miraculous thing, 
And what's he do? He just falls on his face. Oh, what am I going to do? This is God. I'm standing before God. And he says, And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. And what's he do? He gives him a charge. Jesus grabs him. He puts his hand on him and he gives him a charge. He says, Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. This is probably the, the, the greatest book of the whole Bible. And it starts out by being confronted with the Lord. He falls on his face. And what's Jesus do? He lays his hands on him. He gives him a charge. He said, I've got a great task for you. I've got a mission for you. Consider this, man. In, in the digital age, right? Are you using your Facebook for things that God would say is a ministry? Or are you using it just to waste time? To look at other people's selfies? Are you using your, your YouTube, your mouth, your door knocking? Whatever it is, what you invest your time in ought to be as if God laid His hand on you and He's sending you out to do something great. Because in these last times, there will be men that are raised up by God, sent by the Holy Ghost, hands laid on by men, God will give them special gifts. And I just ask you, who's next? Are you next? Are you going? Will you go? Will you be sent by God by the laying on of hands? Because that's God's pattern. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for how You do things, the order that You use. Lord, we don't always understand how things will play out in the mystery of Your Word. But Lord, we take these things on faith and we ask You to build upon them. Lord, we trust in You to help us to grow spiritually by seeking You in Your Word. Lord, I just pray that You would fill the men in this church with Your Holy Spirit. Lord, that You would prepare these men to go out and preach the Gospel, not just here in Jacksonville, but Lord, all across the world. Lord, I pray that You would lay it on their heart, that You would show them the opportunities that are available, and that You would use the men here to do great things for You. Lord, we love You and we thank You for the free gift of salvation. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Amen.